one of the things in Black History Month that is so uh, important to all of us, to our viewers, to those of us who work with you and for you, is that you did break a ceiling. You were a pathbreaker and a pioneer. And what does that mean to you, to be the first African-American anchor? You know, when I was first moved into the job, it was under extraordinary circumstances. And I didn't have time to really focus on that. Uh, the job was, was overwhelming, and uh, it was a, a new opportunity. But uh, a couple of thoughts about that. I've been asked a lot about that. Um, First of all, it's not like there was a sign that said blacks need not apply <laughs> at network news positions. The fact was there were, you know, there were only three jobs and they were all held by guys around my age. So that door had been pretty much shut and you know, I didn't think of that as anything more than just circumstances. Um, I'm grateful that I was selected for it. Um, I think the thing that took me a while to realize was the impact in living rooms and in homes. Uh, my mother reminded me that when I was a, a little boy, I don't remember this, must have been four or five or six, I said something to the effect of, how come there are no colored people on TV? We were colored back then. Um, and I don't remember what her answer was, but uh, it was something that obviously was obvious to a little boy that there were no people of color on TV. Um, and what inspires me is when people you know, tell me that you know, their kids are sitting down, you know, children of color are sitting down and watching uh, yeah. our broadcast. Um, and I hear from, you know, parents sometimes. And the fact that, you know, kids can now look around and, and uh, see somebody that looks like them on TV or somebody they know or their parents, I think is great. Um, just by coincidence, my daughter-in-law uh, yesterday sent me a photo from somebody at her church The little boy watches me and wants an autographed picture. and I, I think it's one of these. I don't, well, you guys won't be able to see it. But I just thought it was a sweet picture. And I, uh, and it, it made me, well, yeah, there it is. I don't know, you can see it. There's a little boy of color. <laughs> and he's watching me, and, and she said, uh, you know, my 10 year old son, Sean, loves nightly news at Lester Holt. Every night I hear at 6 30, Mom, Lester Holt is on. And that picture is, you know, it, it just, that, that's what, that's the part Absolutely. that gets me is that, you know, he can look and see someone that looks kind of like him on TV. And I think, uh, but I, I also think it's important to point out that I think we're getting, we're getting past this idea of, of first this, the first African American, the first homosexual, the first, you know, woman. I think that doors are now, I think we all understand in 2018, most doors are open. So now it's just a matter of timing of, of where we don't even think about it. But it is an honor. And, and moments like that remind me of how important this is. Were there African American journalists who inspired you? Yeah, I mean a lot. You know, Bernie Shaw, um, uh, Carol Simpson, uh, you know, who held down you know the weekends at ABC for, for many years. Uh, Bryant Gumbel, who I think was one of the, is one of the most talented um, uh, interviewers. So I, you know, I was fortunate. I had a lot of um, you know a lot of examples of, of, of great journalists that I could uh, try to mold myself around. I started in this business when I was a teenager, uh, hanging around KCRA in Sacramento as kind of a, sort of an intern, but I was in high school. I was, you know, playing country and Western records when I was in high school on, on the radio. So I had, I was, you know, into the business and I was very keen on watching different people and trying to emulate what, what made them good at what they do. And that's the advice I always give to young people trying to get in. I say, just watch, who do you like? Who do you think's a great communicator? Who's a great reporter? Why do you think they're a good reporter? What is it about Andrea that you see that you like? And then incorporate that as you begin to define your own personality and your own uh, direction as a journalist. I want to ask you about the first, the, the interview you did with President Trump which has now become not just an interview and a really important one, it's now become a piece of evidence in the Mueller investigation. <laughs> um, for, I, uh, for better yeah. or for worse. I, um, I did, that's not, I mean, <laughs> uh, I will, I'll tell you this the story of that, how that interview came about, um, because you mentioned uh, Hope Hicks. Right. She was actually my first point of contact. Uh, I said, you know, I'd like, you know, like to speak to the president. We haven't done an interview since he's become president, and she was quite helpful. And, ushered me into the Oval Office and I asked the president, I said, we should talk. And they made it happen. In the time between they agreed and the time we did it was when uh, Comey was fired. So up until that point, the focus, I had just come from uh, uh, Korea, so I was Did you think they'd cancel? I did, I was happy they didn't. <laughs> um, I thought that spoke a lot to his character, to the, 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 his, his folks, that they didn't because I didn't know if they'd want to go down that road. Um, but obviously, everyone understood the interview was going to have to shift to a more specific topic of that. 
Um, you may have seen he, we, we come in the room and um, in the wide shot he hands me a piece of paper. It was basically a list of uh, Democrats and quotes who had negative quotes about Jim Comey. Uh, he wanted me to have that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and then, you told him you read the tweets and you knew yeah. you, you were um, ready. I'm going to borrow from one of our competitors. Uh, I report, you decide. So let me just uh, <laughs> let me just tell the story. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, we, you know, we went there and um, there was a uh, there was an SNL skit that <laughs> actually captured um, one of the thoughts that went through my mind. Was like he really said it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was surprised, but I, at, same t at the same time, having interviewed, uh, having interviewed Donald Trump as a candidate, I, I came to understand that he tends to own things. He doesn't back down. He tends to double down. And so, standing back, I realized I shouldn't have been surprised um, that he said what he said. Uh, at the same time, there's always that when you walk away from an interview sometimes, I don't know if you've been through this, where you're like, was that his? I think I turned to one of my colleagues. I said, I think we made some news there. There was a. It took a while. It took a while to realize it. Yeah. Um, it was a little jarring at first to see you know keep looking up at at you know cable and seeing the interview and and hearing my name. I you know listen. The, the truth is, I think anybody given that assignment, given the timing of the of the Jim Comey uh, firing, would have asked the exact same questions. Mm, um, but it was. Uh, so. <laughs> but it was. But it's, I mean, at the same time, it was. Uh, it was interesting to be there for. Um, I don't know whether it's a turning point, but certainly a significant moment in this in, entire episode that we're, we're bearing witness to. And you were also the moderator of the first debate in the general election, which we <laughs> was that much fun, huh? <laughs> and uh, we saw the debate. I know something of how you prepared, which was intensively, because you're a guy who does his homework. But what was the dynamic between the two of them? Backstage? Well, you know that you were part of the team. Uh, um, folks may not know, we had an extraordinary team of NBC News journalists who were helping me prepare for that debate. Uh, we did mock debates, um, some of which were, were repeated almost verbatim in the actual, <laughs> in the actual <laughs> debate. But we, you know, we tried to figure out where they would go. And uh, there was a fairly, to me, it was a, kind of a fairly complicated format I was asked to follow. Yeah. And when the debate started, I mean, they just rolled right over the top of me. I was like, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. Um, and, you know, I kept trying to, you know, follow my little thing. And there was a, a moment in time where I said to myself, you know what, screw it. I just, we're just, let's just do this. I, you know, I can't, um, you know, this, any sense of, um, you know, I, I had to weigh this issue of, uh, of fairness, of um, timekeeping, equivalence, uh, yeah. you know, and I just decided, you know what, I'm not a moderator. I didn't, nobody made, we're not trained moderators, but I'm a journalist. So just ask, just ask the questions everybody's curious about and they'll land where they land. So that's kind of what I did. Um, it, it, was a, it was a bigger risk than I knew at the time. Um, I don't like I don't like getting involved in this kind of polarized part of America. I don't really do that. I just, I'm a news guy and, and I recognize that some stories aren't going to make you happy. Um, so be it. But I placed myself right in the middle of it. Uh, and, you know, part of me wonders, you know, does it, is it, hurt, does it hurt me today? I don't know. Um, but the, the emails, uh, you know, were, you know, I would go through, I was, in the days after I was going through my phone and like, Awesome job, super loser, pathetic, great. <laughs> you know, it was just, and, and I think the hardest part was the lead up to it. Um, I, was, I would sit there and I would, you know, I would watch cable news and they're talking about me. And Lester will do this. Well, I think Lester should do this. And I'm not used to being that. And it was like, whoa, guys, you're you know, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and both sides were playing me. You know, the Trump folks were saying, you know, Lester's going to be really tough, and the Hillary folks were saying, "Well, you know, uh, I hope I hope he fact checks fact checks him," and and you know, so I turn off the TV and I'd meditate, and uh, it was a <laughs> no, I really meditated. I was uh, I picked up meditation during that, um, <laughs> but I remember uh, at the at the end of the evening we had a little reception with our our staff, and uh, I was leaving, and one of the people from the debate commission said, "You know, great great job. I'm hoping to see you in four years." And I said, "Lose my number." Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't 
I, I, I said that at the time. I don't know whether I do it again. But I, I do think it's an interesting discussion, though, of why it, is it a good role for journalists? Um, I think, I think it's something that should be discussed. Is it, is it a good role for journalists, particularly in this very polarized environment we're in? Um, we're not debate moderators. We're journalists. And so, as I tried to do, we're going to go for the, we're gonna go for the, the stories. Perfect. And they may not necessarily fall in, in what people think is fairness and equivalence uh, and all that. But uh, I have not watched that debate yet. I was at another forum very much like this, and they showed a 30-second clip and I, you know, I looked away. It was, uh, um, it was not a fun experience, but at the same time, it was incredibly gratifying to be asked, to be part of it. Um, uh, but I have never done anything more stressful in my life, and I can't imagine anything more stressful.